to a live episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. What's up, SGS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. Uh, of course, this is uh, a show that is so good. It happens every Friday. Great Scott, it's your true crime, Phil. And uh, of course, it, it consists of best guests, super special agent, retired Scott Duffy of the FBI, who is now the director of criminal justice at Wilmington University in Delaware. And of course, America's most respected detective, Phil Waters, F-I-L, not P-H-I-L. Uh, he owns Kindred Spirits Investigations. He also owns two Ferraris, and he might be in the process of buying a third because he is nowhere to be found. Now, God bless him, as he would say to me, because he just had a knee replacement. But um, Scott Duffy, unless I heard incorrectly, did Phil Waters not say he was joining us at 5 p.m., right? Yes, he should be joining us today. So yeah. he, he told us he has mm -hmm. a very high th he has a high threshold for pain. He does. Uh, he is doing well. He's not even taking pain meds, and he should be here. I'm a bit concerned unless um unless, of course, uh he's I don't know, delayed at therapy, but um it's never stopped us before. Uh Scott. Um, happily married to my wife, but I, I can't help but notice how sporty and handsome you look today. Just um, very, uh, you know, sleek with your your hoodie. You look very sporty today. You look very clean cut. Has anyone told you that today? You're the first, Joel, so thank you. You're quite welcome. Quite <laughs> welcome. Um, meanwhile, some of the, um, you know, we learned all about the uh, Adelsons. Uh, just a little inside baseball here today. Um, typically, Carm and the COE will gang up on me. Uh, that's typically how it works. And then uh, they get whatever agenda they have. But today, Carm has actually backed off. She hasn't really bugged me. But uh, the COE, uh, you know, she's... If you ever saw the... We, we just binged watched... Uh, and I'm, I'm very embarrassed to say this, actually, this morning, um, or the morning show, I don't even know what it's called, on Apple TV. It is about the morning uh, network news wars written by Brian Stelter, formerly of CNN. And, uh, oh, by the way, someone says, you're wearing a crew neck, not a hoodie. What do I know? But it's close enough. Anyway, um, so the COE wanted to watch it. I agreed. I actually was sort of into it. It's basically a soap opera about the morning news show. Since I worked in news and I, you know, know some of these people a little bit peripherally, thought we would watch it. But the, the reason I bring this up is the CO, COE thinks she's the producer from the show. Is it called the morning show, Bugs? I have no idea. But anyway, she thinks she's, yeah, Reese Witherspoon, who just, I see a comment somewhere, just flew by me. Uh, morning show is good. It is pretty good. It's kind of addictive in a very cheesy way. By the way, people are going to like, they're going to throw, yeah, Jennifer and Reese, amazing show. Now, I got to tell you, I never, ever saw a show in my life with uh, John Hamm in it. Uh, not once. I got to say, and I, I'm like, I'm pretty, you just heard me compliment Scott. Like, I'm just not that impressed with John Hamm. There's something about him. Um, he just doesn't seem to me like he's very intelligent. He's probably a nice guy. Um, I'll probably get canceled for saying this, but I don't know. He just kind of looks like a like kind of like a dum dum a little bit. Um, he's big, he's strong, and all that. But I don't know. The COE has a huge crush on Adam Sandler. Um, Scott Duffy, I don't want to get personal, but does your does your your wife must like um, like manly men because you're kind of a manly man. Like my wife likes <laughs> me and she likes Adam She's Sam. Like, like me. <laughs> and she likes like Paul Rudd. Like these are the COE's types. Like if she really liked manly men, she wouldn't like me, right? But did you, your wife must like manly men. So maybe she would like John Ham. Yeah, I'm not sure if she's a John Ham fan. There, I'm just, there's a couple that are coming to mind. She's mentioned. I'm trying to think. Um, 
boy, here we go. I'm afraid to see this. Phil is back here. Um, is he? Good? Yes. <laughs> oh boy, he's gone. As fast as we put him up, he just disappeared himself, as he would say. I'll, I'll, hold on, he's back now. He's back now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ferrari number three or what? Can you see me? We can, can see, see you. I can, can hear you. you. Fantastic. Can you hear us? I am convalescing. Are you <laughs> able to hear us, Phil Waters? <laughs> I don't think I've he's got here. my uh, my. Uh, that, that's his free nugget, nugget shirt, shirt. On here, by the way. Yeah. Is is a. Uh, Scott, is Phil on drugs right now, or is he? Just <laughs> <laughs> this might be the best episode ever. Coming, Phil, can you hear? Shirt. Phil, Look can you hear that. us? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have to remove him. Hold on. I have a feeling that Phil might be on some funny pills right now. Hang on a sec. I have to send um, the COE Phil's number. That's People are going to, this show is so incredibly off the rails this early on. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to get it on it's track. I, yeah, I think so. It depends what. He looks great. But yeah, I, I guess it depends. But the whole reason I was to, um, I'm going to have to, let me just bring the COE in for a minute. Now I'm sweating for no apparent reason. Um, COE, uh, Phil is online too. I don't think he can hear us, and I don't know if it's the medication or the connection. I just sent you his number. Can you? I can hear hey, you. Phil. Hi, oh, Phil. Can you hear us? He's there. This yeah. I can. Can. Okay, can great. Us. You weren't hearing us. I didn't know if it was the codeine or the connection. Phil Waters. I am taking no narcotics. It's amazing. Uh, Phil, how are you feeling? I feel great. I went to the doctor this morning uh, for my first checkup 10 days out, and uh, things are actually better than expected, I guess. I've been uh, <clears throat> working hard with the physical therapist and the workout regimen, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's coming right along. It's the world of physical therapy and ice packs at this point so phil uh scale of one to ten one being the least ten the most what is the pain scale that's what they keep asking me that's funny that you say that that's weird i'm a doctor i guess yeah you are um it's about a four well i gotta tell you this and i'd say it to his face yeah i guess you're more of a man doc case because he said it was the most god-awful pain for for months like four, five, six months. I didn't want to tell you that, but you, uh, I don't know. You're a Marine. You're an undercover narcotics officer. You're a detective. Um, are you able to, are, like, are you walking? Oh yeah. You are. I got rid of the walker about as fast as I could do that. So, uh, that's, um, that, uh, that's miserable. So, uh, you have a cool you, cane. Yeah. Can you bend your, can you bend your knee? Can you bend your yeah. knee, Phil? I'm at, uh, they wanted me at, at 90 degrees, you know, to the ground. So I'm, I'm there. Yeah. Wow. I'm very impressed, Phil. Very impressed. Yeah. Um, so Phil, right before you got on, we were talking about attractive men. I know your favorite subject. Um, okay. I was saying, um, I was and saying then, that I thought then Phil popped on. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as uh, you said that. 100%. Phil, do you know who John Hamm is? The actor? Yeah, he's the guy from Mad Men, I think. Yeah, he's in the uh, latest uh, rendition of Fargo. Yeah, he's uh, he's a good guy. Yeah, I like him. He's like, he's like a man's man. But I saw him, the COE and I watched a show about the morning TV wars. I don't know. Maybe it's just me being jealous. But I, I thought he was a little overrated. But then again, the COE likes me. She likes Adam Sandler. And she likes Paul Rudd, who are all like, you know, nerdy. The only problem is those guys have about 800 million more dollars than me. But, um, and then I was starting to ask Scott if his wife likes manly men, like, like, uh, John Hamm. And I'm assuming that I have a hunch, Phil, that your wife doesn't like nerdy Jewish guys. I have a, I have a feeling. <laughs> I have a feeling. Well, so, he likes you. 
So, uh, <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> oh, and by the way, by the way, uh, yeah. thank you. Got the little uh, care package today from y'all. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Donna that- and, uh, and uh, your family. That was very, very nice. And, and all stuff that I will consume. That is uh, not just from the COE and myself. That is from all of STS Nation, Scott Duffy, the whole gang. Um, eat all that basket. Um, I think the wife asked, does Phil want cookies and stuff or and, and cake, or does he want, I, forget, I think the other option was fruit and nuts. And I said, send him the junk food. Yeah, no, it's got the chocolate and the popcorn and uh, the truffles and... Oh yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's everything I like for sure. All right, excellent. So, um, by the way, quick quick reminder: if you can support us on Patreon, YouTube, you can listen to us on audio. All our audio issues were uh, fixed this week after I had a mini heart attack about that. We went offline because we switched publishers, so we should be good on the audio side. Uh, this Monday, seven p.m., we've got. Dennis Murphy from Dateline NBC. He's coming on with Dave Arenberg, uh, Florida uh, state attorney out of Palm Beach County, and John Singer. Uh, they have not reacted to Charlie's sentencing, Donna being in court, all of this stuff. So they're coming on. And Dennis Murphy and Dave Arenberg are going to be at this in person, um, at this in person gathering with Ruth Markell running the show on Wednesday down here in South Florida. So it's a little preview into that. So um, today we, um, Phil and Scott, we have some jailhouse calls. I know the two of you have not followed this probably the way a lot of people STS nation have, Uh, but these are the calls jailhouse calls. And just to remind everyone, Dan Markell was an FSU law professor went to Harvard undergrad, Harvard graduate school. He is teaching at FSU and he gets shot in his driveway back in July, uh, July 18th to be exact, 2014. He dies the next day. So he suffered a little bit, which was horrific. Uh, Turns out police do their thing. Um, by the grace of God, uh, the next door neighbor, uh, elderly gentleman sees what appears to be a silverish car. Amazing investigators are able to, uh, are able to track it down and eventually find the hitmen. eventually find the middle woman. And the rest, as they say, is sort of history because it's not completely over yet, but November 6th, Charlie Adelson is convicted, found guilty in a court of law on all three charges. The following week, November 13th, Donna Adelson, the matriarch, uh, she she is arrested, taken into custody. She was trying to flee the country. She was trying to get to Vietnam via Dubai. And uh, I'm reading some of these comments. Very distracted. Very glad it's a Friday. Uh, Can't wait for this weekend because I'm around. By the way, it's about 180 degrees in my house, but it's chilly in Florida, so I may pass out at any given moment. Um, I used to tell myself, uh, one of my biggest fears reporting, by the way, was just passing out during a live shot on air. You can ask anyone. It's a big, irrational fear. And then I used to do some anchoring, and I was like, oh, you can't uh, pass out when you're sitting down. And someone assured me that you can pass out sitting down. So if I do pass out, Um, That is my biggest, next to prison, of course, passing out is my biggest fear realized. Phil, you're not holding that phone, are you? I am holding the phone. Why? Because I feel like uh, your arm is going to get very tired and you might need to rest that. I don't know. It's making me nervous. Can I, uh, before we get into this, I need to make a couple of corrections. Yeah, please, please, please. The first one is a couple, two or three weeks ago now. Uh, somebody had mentioned uh, my old friend Mark Castellano and the Michelle Warner case, and and I was talking about how he had murdered her in Houston and then took her to his parents' house. And I kept using the uh, city of Lubbock. Well, it wasn't Lubbock. He took her to Odessa, mm. which is right next to Midland, and he buried her in Midland. So I don't mm. know why I had Lubbock on the brain, but uh, uh, it was actually Odessa. So I wanted to make that correction. Uh, for anybody that cares, 
But mm. um, and then the second thing is, uh, I guess two uh, weeks ago or mm. maybe three weeks prior to this knee replacement stuff, I was telling about the process building up to it. And uh, I kept referring to the bacterial soap that I was told very yeah. explicitly to not use on my privates. Mm. So I, uh, I read into the literature and not only was I not supposed to use it on my privates, but I was not supposed to use it on my anus as well. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm just using the word that's in the word. <laughs> used in the I'll tell you why I'm <laughs> laughing, but I'll tell you afterwards. Go ahead. So, uh, and I was, and I kept using the term bacterial soap. Yes. Well, immediately those people that feel a need to correct me uh, jumped in there and said it's not bacterial, it's antibacterial soap, and they are correct. You're 100% right. I should so, have thought that. Yeah. I, wanted to, I wanted to acknowledge uh, my error and uh, appreciate those that were so quick to point it out so that I could get it on the record and corrected that it was antibacterial soap. And the stuff that I bought at the store, I can use it on those parts that I've just described. Uh, but I was very good at keeping the stuff that they gave me, which was the prescription super duper antibacterial soap off of those parts, which I have mm. just described. So for those of you that uh, want to be satiated that you corrected me, you were correct. I acknowledge that, and thank you so much. Phil, are you 100% sure you're not on any medication right now? No, none, no. Really? I, uh, well, I am taking Celebrex twice a day, but that's an anti-inflammatory. Oh. Uh, gave me the oxycodone. They gave me the good stuff. Mm. And uh, I do not participate in introducing any kind of narcotic into my body, no matter how bad it may get. Mm. So I have uh, resisted taking oxycodone and I have taken maybe, maybe a dozen Tylenol over the course of the last 10 days. So he's a, he's a man's man. Phil, can you hold up the phone so we can see your free nugget shirt? That is, um, by the way, I am not T-Pain. Uh, her friend is the artist that behind that. There it is. There it is. Um, I still think. You should have put Scott's head in one helicopter and your head in the other. The only problem is I can't do graphic design. So I had to go with what was, uh, yes, Phil is wearing his free nugget shirt. A uh, look at Sherry's news chiming in here. John Hamm is sexy and funny. Mad men did it for me. Gorgeously dressed hairstyle. Nice, tall, thin, sexy. Anytime. What a man followed by Dennis Murphy. Um, and uh, he's hilarious in Fargo. If you if, if you watch the Cohen brother, the Fargo series, uh, the new one this year, uh, John Hamm plays this sheriff and it is hysterical. So, uh, yeah, he's he's a good actor. I like him. Oh, by the way, Phil, another correction for you. Anuses oh. are a private part, too. At least <laughs> at least <laughs> I'm just telling you. What it said in the literature, it was very specific mm. of that mm. area of the body. So I was very, uh, very careful. Mm. Uh, the things that we've discussed already in the first 19 minutes of this show um, really blow my mind. I, I brought up the whole John Hamm thing because the COE thinks she's the producer from the fictional morning show, which has John Hamm in it. And so... Uh. She's like talking in my ear right as we're going on, telling me, and I'm like, it's a Friday. Life is too serious to be taken seriously. We'll figure this out as we go well, I, uh, on the I, fly. I, last week, Scott, I mean, I watched it after the, you know, I watched the replay. You guys did a great job, but I was fascinated that I received much criticism and wasn't even there. And then, of course... <laughs> <laughs> they had an hour and a half of Scott Duffy. I mean, they could have OD'd on Scott, and yeah. yet, and yet, the criticisms came in that Joel that you monopolized most of the time and yes. did not 
gotten Duffy enough. So uh, those people are just like, uh, uh, you know, they're like psychos. I mean, they will never be satiated. They just, uh, yeah. their well, pan panties are in a wad constantly, constantly in, in, in wadding. They try to find something, something to get wadded about. So there it, you go. it goes to show you the star power of Scott Duffy. People just could not get enough of him. They cannot get enough of him speaking. One thing before I forget. So the word, what happened to Phil? What? Phil, Phil, are you there? He's got, Oh yeah, I'm here. Yeah, my All right. So, so my. that, that word you mentioned, that private part that rhymes with the planet Uranus. Um, yeah. I just happened to hear something. I think it was NPR. It was like a normal broadcast, whatever, whatever. I don't know. I was listening to something. But I never knew this. And you guys might find this fascinating, um, being investigators. Everyone's thing down there is like a fingerprint. They're all completely different. There are no two Uranuses alike in the world. None. None. Did you know that? Did either well, of you know that? Everybody's got one, right? Yeah, everyone's got. I like one. opinion. Yes, but that's you. Right? I do have a follow-up question, though, if I can. Uh -oh. Yeah. What? Sure. What is the consequence if oh. you did use the soap? Great question. I not. You know that is a great question. It doesn't tell you. It leaves it as a mystery. And uh, I guess the only way you would find out if you were curious enough to apply it in those areas of the body and see what happens. Um, I'm assuming it's some sort of, uh, it could be anything from a, uh, a burning sensation to uh, sterilization. So I don't know. My guess is uh, burning. Uh, look at this first question related to true crime and it comes 22 minutes in. Um, and by the way, I was wrapping up. So Charlie gets uh, convicted. He was just last week. He was sentenced to, uh, in Florida, Phil, when they say life in prison, they mean life in prison, Phil Waters. And uh, so he was sentenced to life in prison, and he's already at the uh, reception area in Chipley, Florida, as we speak. And by the way, this is what he looks like right now. Got the, the prison mugshot. He was transferred to the... Uh, Transferred to the Northwest Florida Reception Center in Chipley. Phil Waters, why do they shave your head when you go to the reception area? When you're put in prison? Yes, sir. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I don't know the answer to that other than it's kind of like when I went in the Marines, they shaved all of our heads there as well. So uh, I think it is to uh, bring everybody into a perspective of commonality that uh you know here's what you are you're now you've been relegated to being a number mm. so just to fill in the gaps he's now at this uh reception area uh i can't imagine a reception he's getting and donna adelson just had her uh, arraignment and so she was in court and since uh since Charlie's conviction, there have been a lot of jailhouse calls and some members of the media got their hands on it. We are getting our audio from Gigi McKelvey of Pretty Lies and Alibis. What we did yesterday, Phil Waters and Scott Duffy, is I played audio for psychologists and their take was fascinating. And then it occurred to me, I've got two of the best investigators in America on my show on Friday why don't we play some more calls and see what they what they think from a potential investigative standpoint? Because you guys listen to these calls, too. Um, and by the way, I call Tommy Scoville. So there's a couple you're going to see in a few minutes. There's a couple of calls with Donna Adelson, who, not unlike my mother, doesn't necessarily hang up the phone, doesn't do this. So people kept wondering how could she be recording because she was recording when she wasn't speaking to Charlie. If the minute Charlie hangs up, the call is supposed to end. But Tommy <laughs> Scoville told me that if you're even calling Charlie Adelson, it is recording already that the calls are recording constantly on both ends. So uh, that is the answer from Tommy Scoville, who is a former inmate did a lot of hard time, and he explained that to me. But here's a question, and then we'll get into some of these calls. 
And I have other stories if this gets completely out of hand. From Angela, here's a question for today uh, to Scott Duffy. Why are most jail prison recordings so bad? It seems like from a justice standpoint, they'd be worth the investment. The audio is generally horrible. Scott Duffy, do you happen to know the answer to this? I, I wouldn't say most. So take the most out and then it really all depends like anything else. Why are a lot of bank surveillance cameras so bad, but there are a lot, a lot that are very well. So it all depends what the investment is. Are they a digital high quality, great uh, prison call with, the, of course, you're going to get a lot of background, but then, yeah, I've, I've, I've really had to listen real close to, to some. So, um, uh, it, it, I guess it all depends on the prison and the investment in the audio recording aspect. So I, I, I've heard a good combination. Delaware has some good ones and uh, some, and the Fed system have some good ones, but then I've run into bad ones. So it's, it, it's like anything else. What's, what's the investment in that, um, in that software and whatnot. By the way, someone here is asking if the Ruth event is going to be recorded. We are working on taping it. It won't be live because people are paying for this event. Um, and Ruth is basically coordinating it with Jafco. And again, I will tweet it out at Podcast STS. I'll put the flyer out uh, on Twitter at Podcast STS. And I will also put it out on Surviving the Survivor uh, on our Instagram page. And uh, we will leave it there so people can still sign up. It's this Wednesday, 7 p.m. You can still sign up uh, for that. Um, Phil Waters, I'm going to put a photo up. This is Donna Adelson, and I'd just like to get your honest reaction to what you're seeing here. Uh, this is her piping up during her arraignment, incredulous. that you know She was deemed to be a suicide risk. She said she wasn't. She started talking. The judge told her. Pipe down, let your lawyer talk to you. But this is a still shot. Your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, golly, talk about uh, a bad angle. Um, <laughs> gosh, I don't know. That's a uh, that looks like some sort of uh, I don't know. That's a cross between a a T Rex and an angry horse, right? I don't know. Yeah. Well, someone, um, the internet is un is undefeated, as they say. Someone put a little monkey with its mouth open next to her, and they looked uh, identical. So that, uh, that's horrible. Yeah. Um. But a picture is worth a thousand words. At oh, this, yeah. uh, you know, at this arraignment, she was really incredulous. She knew everything better than the judge, better than the attorneys. Phil Waters, does that surprise you, being that she's uh, depicted to be the mastermind of this whole? Uh, criminal family oh no i'm sure uh, she's uh she's a uh a narcissist in the uh true form and she uh i think she's just reeling uh from the consequences and she doesn't quite at least at this point comprehend what she got herself into thinking that mm. she could manipulate all these family members, the circumstance and, um, uh, and, uh, yeah, she's, um, wow. It's, it's all, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the invasion of the lizard people, right? They all come in human form. Then all of a sudden they, the uh, human facade starts to fall away from them. And, and here's what you have as a result. Yeah. Donna, it's a, she needs antibacterial soap in that mouth, misdemeanor OG says. Well, and her not to be the uh, that may be that area that we've been talking about right there. So uh, I don't. Um, again, you know, I know it's a bit immodest, but anyone who doesn't think that this could be a Super Bowl halftime show, imagine this, Bill, at Dallas Cowboys Stadium on their three hundred billion dollar screen that extends the length of the state and we put up this still shot we talk about it crowd would go out absolutely wild on this um well, you're not taking you're not taking the meds but they say donna is taking the meds phil oh i'm sure she's taking a lot of uh yeah uh, all right so listen so this is what i think we should do i've got audio tape and i am curious so 
these are recordings that sometimes they don't realize they're being recorded. And this is post Charlie's conviction. Um, again, the, by the way, Scott, you brought up a really interesting point. I mean, were you, you must have experienced cases of bank robberies where you could have ID'd the person if they had better video, right? We're talking about the quality of these calls, but would you get to banks oftentimes and the video quality was just crap, so you couldn't catch who you needed to catch? Yeah, so I I came in right at the at at the changeover from VHS and and into the digital world. So definitely in the latter part of my career. We um we dealt with a lot of banks that had great video. I, I would get it in 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 a couple of minutes because of the ability to download it as opposed to a VHS tape. So, so someone's telling me to take I forgot the photo was up. Someone's like, can you please take it down? Sorry about <laughs> that. Um Bill Waters from Thomas. What evidentiary value do these calls, if any, have at this point when the Adelsons are acutely aware calls are being recorded and released to the public? They're using the, the calls to say they are innocent. But isn't it true, Phil, that a lot of times people, for whatever the psychological reasoning is, they just sort of forget that these calls are recorded, right? Right. Well, you know, the, the ones that I've listened to, it, it you, you kind of get because you're as a detective or uh, investigator, you're you're trying to listen for the coded messaging in these discussions and the effort that's being made to say things to one another, thinking that the way we're saying that they can't put this on us because. We're not talking specifically about this and that, but we know that these certain representations mean what we are talking about in reality. And so it, I, you know, I've, I mean, I've listened to some of these calls where the person on the other side from the jail, very well aware, because I think as you've mentioned before, there are signs posted everywhere in about every kind of language saying that these calls are being recorded. Mm. And I've I've listened to some where the the person they're talking to on the outside they are cautioning them, and, and and it's pretty brazen, and it's really not a big deal because everybody knows these things are being recorded. So it's not like they're trying to be sneaky; they're just saying, "Be careful," because it's being recorded. And uh, and then you have some like this that that you know they're trying they they're trying to talk, I guess, in some sort of code and thinking that people aren't going to figure out what they're talking about. And, you know, and it becomes a challenge of trying to put together nuances in these conversations that they're trying to encrypt over these recorded calls. Hmm. So once again, these calls are coming to us courtesy of Gigi McKelvey of Pretty Lies and Alibis. Uh, they were released and some people with the right sources were able to get them. They were not, they were not released publicly, but they were released to some people. Uh, and uh, obviously some people got their hands on them. So by the way, pirate girl says that Donna looks like she's waiting for an adult bird to throw up in her mouth and feed her. That's an interesting uh, uh, way of looking at it. Uh, someone said, woohoo go Cowboys. So here's the first call. Let's, let's listen together. I think this one's a little on the lengthy side, but there is a Freud potential Freudian slip in here, and we'll point it out uh, and we'll discuss. But uh, Scott and Phil, your job here is to look at this as investigators and tell us if there's anything here that strikes you or fancy. I wrote this last night. We know you never ask anything about your brother. This is 8 o'clock last night. Let me preface this, by the way. I'm sorry to do this. This obviously is called Donna possibly implicates Wendy. Now, this is Donna being caught on a hot mic moment, as we're calling it. So she has hung up with Charlie and she's talking to people in her home where she's calling from and it's being recorded. Charlie's not on the other end. And she's talking about her relationship with her daughter is now strained and they're only texting. So she's now relaying a text that she just got from daughter Wendy. So that's the setup here. I wrote this last night. We know you never ask anything about your brother. 
this is eight o'clock last night, but we just got off the phone with him. And the first thing he asked was, how's Wendy holding up? I didn't have the heart to tell him that you never called up or asked about him. I just said, we weren't up to phone calls right now. Everyone looks to protect you. I bet you've got a lot to think about. But then she didn't answer. But then I got another call from Charlie. And I said, just got off the phone with Charlie. He's worried about you. He wants to know why we didn't speak. I told him a lie. I said, we're only speaking with you and Dan right now. I couldn't bear to tell him the truth. Your sister never even called us is the truth. So she says this morning, I thought she'd be racing over here last night. Yeah. Dear mom, I know you are upset by the verdict, but the anger directed at me is not justified. I don't know how much anger we don't. I'm not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. I am not guilty because I did not do anything wrong and I was not involved in any way with Danny's. I'm going to stop it right there for one second. I'll tell you why. Because Don is about to say something that people are construing in two different ways. Um, and then we'll discuss it. So, and I'll explain. But Don is about to say something that some people are hearing one way and others are hearing another. But Wendy is saying here to her in this text, I'm innocent. I didn't do this. By the way, keep in mind, Scott and Phil, Wendy's an attorney and she knows, uh, you know, that stuff can be incriminating. So she's very careful with her language, even though this is a text message to her mother. But here we go. Yeah. When I was interviewed by the police and testified in court, I told the truth as I was required to do. I cannot control how the prosecutor used my statement to Charlie's trial. Again, I didn't say that. Also, as you know, my, I do know, my lawyer has advised me not to talk to my family or anyone else about this case. No, about the case, which is true. We, we've never done it. I followed his advice despite your disagreements with this guidance. Please do not text me about this case anymore. Um, so we're going to, well, look, before we go back and play it. So there's a part on here where, and this is actually a, a, an, a tweet I got from someone named April. Just catching up on the lives from last night, I've intentionally not looked at the transcripts and maintain that Donna says, yes, you were, when she says she's not guilty, instead of uh, not she was, or I didn't say she was when it comes to guilty. So after Wendy says she's guilty, people are either hearing Donna say, yes, you were guilty, or they're hearing her say, I didn't say she was guilty. So it's a little confusing. It's a little awkward. But let's listen one more time to the whole thing, and then I'll get Bill and Scott's take on this. I don't know if I've confused this to the point where they have no idea what I'm talking about. Here we go. I wrote this last night. We know you never ask anything about your brother. This is 8 o'clock last night. But we just got off the phone with him, and the first thing he asked was, how's Wendy holding up? I didn't have the heart to tell him that you never called up or asked about him. I just said, we weren't up to phone calls right now. Everyone looks to protect you. I bet you've got a lot to think about. But then she didn't answer. But then I got another call from Charlie. And I said, just got off the phone with Charlie. He's worried about you. He wants to know why we didn't speak. I told him a lie. I said, we're only speaking with you and Dan right now. I couldn't bear to tell him the truth. Your sister never even called us is the truth. So she says this morning, I thought she'd be racing over here last night. Yeah. Dear mom, I know you are upset by the verdict, but the anger directed at me is not justified. I don't know how much anger we don't. I'm not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. I am not guilty because I did not do anything wrong and I was not involved in any way with Danny's death. When I was interviewed by the police and testified in court, I told the truth as I was required to do. I cannot control how the prosecutor used my statement to Charlie's trial. Again, I didn't say that. Also, as you know, my, I do know, my lawyer has advised me not to talk to my family or anyone else about this case. No, about the case, which is true, we've never done it. I followed his advice despite your disagreements with this guidance. Please do not text me about this case anymore. Okay, so let's hold it there. And then I'm going to, 
I realize why it's extra confusing because Gigi took the controversial part out and, and she also, I think, um, may have taken the text out, but I'm going to show you where it is. But Bill Waters, you've, you've, uh, handled 400 homicide investigations. What, what's your, um, reading of this call and the interaction going on between Donna Adelson and her daughter, Wendy here? <clears throat> well, let me understand the setting here. Yes. She has just gotten off the phone with her third son. Correct. No, no, no. She's gotten off the phone. So Donna just had a jailhouse call with Charlie Adelson. Okay. So He's... where so the call did not disconnect from the jail and it's recording this discussion? Uh, that yeah, that's that's what happened. We don't know how, but that's what happened. And this is, by the way, this is in the week from Charlie's conviction before Donna was taken into custody. So Donna is free at this point. Um, it's from November 6th. This is actually the day of the verdict. This is the day of the verdict that Charlie calls Donna, his mother, and then <clears throat> Donna has a conversation with Charlie and then relays to someone else this story about Wendy and her not speaking. And there is somebody in the room at her house. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Venting to about this lack of uh, empathy, I guess, for her son from the daughter. Is that? Yes. Correct. There's a woman because you do hear a woman's voice. We don't know who that person is. Correct. He's the bottom line is she's mad at her daughter. Yes. Yeah. Now, now explaining to this other woman, this other third party there not knowing that it's being picked up on this recording. And, uh, well, it just sounds to me like she's, uh, she's bitching about the fact that the daughter doesn't, uh, has, has been involved as much as she's been involved in terms of questions and answers and in court and so forth and so on. And she seems to think, at least it appears to me that the, uh, her daughter has not done enough to either defend the third son or um, doesn't even appear to be showing any particular concern. And so the daughter's responding with, I'm not going to discuss this anymore. Don't text me. Don't. Uh, because. I would imagine at this point, everybody in this family is pretty paranoid, mm -hmm. given what one's involvement may or may not be. So, 100% correct. I would agree with that. Right? So everybody is, and you said that the daughter is a lawyer, right? She, yeah, well. and that yeah. So keep in mind here, because this is important. She is now not speaking to her mother Donna. She's only texting her. And in right. this text, she says, My attorney advised me not. Like she's very, and she says very explicitly, I had nothing to do with this. But I think she's very smart. She knows that, you know, these she could read this to Charlie. She know it could go out on a recorded line. Do you think Phil Waters, and then we'll get Scott's take. Do you think, Phil Waters, that Wendy is sort of setting up an alibi with this text or a, if not an alibi, at least a, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, a, a proclamation of innocence? Well, I don't think so. I mean, she's already been interviewed by the police, right? She's testified in trial, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. She's smart enough to get to where she's gotten thus far. And she's not yet been charged with anything. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I'm saying, is she is she doubling down on that by by making sure in text that she's saying I had nothing to do with this? Sure, she is. Yeah. She's she's had another moment here uh, to restate the obvious, which is I was compelled to tell the truth. I told the truth. I cannot be responsible with how the prosecutor took what I said and used it in the manner in which they used it. And by the way, do not discuss this with me again. We're not talking about this anymore. 
Um, oh yeah, I think I think it sounds to me like the daughter uh, is uh, is pretty sharp, and she is maintaining her position that she was not involved in it, and is going to continue to say things that further bolster that position. So yeah, no, it's it's pretty odd. Mom is trying to run the narrative here and the daughter's having none of it. And by the way, this is what I figured out, but Jackie uh, Bay, I can't see because it's blocking. Please tell Joel the part Gigi took out was the salient part. That is true. We're going to go back, but Scott Duffy, at first blush, seeing this, the family dynamics, the mother pissed at the daughter, the daughter texting the mother saying, don't talk to me about this case. What do you make of this as an investigator, not as Scott Duffy, the human? Yeah. So, so if I was just listening and like, like uh, any other investigator requesting from the uh, detention center, Hey, I'm interested in these calls. Can you send them to me? If, if Florida is like Delaware in the sense that uh, they could give them over with a simple subpoena or request, then, um, then I'm listening. And so listening to this, I, yeah. I would see something for me as an investigator to go forward as, as of course we said last week, this, that, you know, are there other members, obviously Donna now arrested that this wasn't just um, a one-off, right. And, and something going beyond Charlie. So I would look from this phone call, I don't see anything incriminating said just from what you played. Now we'll see what, with the other part that was taken out, but just on that, I'd be like, okay, it's, um, I'd be interested in probably, um, taking another crack with, uh, um, Wendy and, and, and the attorneys to say, Hey, you know, we'd like to get a little bit more it depending on the direction of law enforcement and additional co-conspirators. But I, I would, I'm, even though I know this wasn't part of it, I would be very surprised, for example, if something incriminating was said during that time, I would be extremely shocked that it would not be tossed out of court. It, it'd be a fierce battle. Mm -hmm. First of all, I don't understand how this took place where I, I understand a few few seconds before and a few seconds after where there is that, that recording. And, and if he didn't disconnect, the fact that she disconnected, but it's still recording something. My thought would be that um, if if something was said incriminating, the defense would say, "Hey, that's that's a wiretap. That's you know that goes beyond you know the the um, the voluntariness of of hey she's calling Charlie or Charlie's calling her. There's that mutual conversation. Everybody knows it's recorded. And uh, end of story. Once. Once the disconnect is there, I, I would be extremely shocked if they were in, to introduce anything after that for that period of time. I mean, I'm I'm curious from from a technology how how that took place. But but that being said, I I I didn't see I didn't hear anything incriminating. Okay, so here um, I believe this is the part with the audio. It's very confusing, but it, I didn't realize it. Uh, Gigi of Pretty Lies and Alibis took out sort of the important part. This, uh, COE, help me out here. I think this is the one with it. Let's play it. And uh, by the way, I've seen different people say different things about the audio levels. Well, um, Gigi has a system to clean up audio. You can clean up audio quite a bit. Go ahead, COE. I was just going to clarify. I don't think she took it out, but audio is obviously on different stuff is on different channels. So I think in some of the audio, depending on how you edit it, you can hear more of the background and you can hear more of the channel one versus channel two or whatever. But this one here, you can hear a little better. There's a producer. Here we go. So let's listen to this and I'll point out the part that is controversial. Here we go again. So she says this morning, I thought she'd be racing over here last night. Yeah. Dear mom, I know you were upset by the verdict. But the anger directed at me is not justified. I don't know how much anger we really don't. I'm not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. I am not guilty because I did not do anything wrong and I was not involved in any way with Danny's death. 
This is the part coming up right here. You see that next line? Didn't say she was. So some people think she says didn't say she was. Others think she says, yes, you were in terms of involved in any way. So this is the critical point. So now I'm going to take it back to the top. We'll watch it again. We are breaking down audio here on STS. Here we go. This morning. I thought she'd be racing over here last night. Yeah. Dear mom, I know you are upset by the verdict, but the anger directed at me is not justified. I don't know how much anger we don't. I'm not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. I am not guilty because I did not do anything wrong and I was not involved in any way with Danny's death. Here she was. When I was interviewed by the police and testified in court, I told the truth as I was required to do. I cannot control how the prosecutor used my statement to Charlie's trial. Again, I didn't say that. Also, as you know, my, I do know, my lawyer has advised me not to talk to my family or anyone else about this case, no, about the case, which is true, we, we've never done it. I followed his advice despite your disagreements with this guidance. Please do not text me about this case anymore. So she said okay, so gonna, this morning. Oh, I meant, I thought she'd be okay. So I'm gonna pause it right there. So Phil Waters, this is what we heard before, but this is the part that was omitted in Gigi's part. And I'll, um, she says, this is Wendy, uh, Wendy texting to Donna, I cannot control how the prosecutor used my statement. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Here we go. Up here. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know how much anger uh, said uh, we don't. I'm not. This is Wendy now speaking to her mom in a text. Wendy to mom. I'm not responsible in any way for Charlie's situation. I am not guilty because I did not do anything wrong. And I was not involved in any way with Danny's death. And this is where Donna chimes in the audio kind of breaks up here and some people say donna says didn't didn't say she was involved but others say uh yes you were um phil waters could this ever be admissible in a court of law um i mean it's a publicly recorded jailhouse call um but the audio is obviously not very crisp and a prosecutor who would be prosecuting, let's say, Wendy Adelson one day might say Donna Adelson said, yes, you were guilty. Your own mother said it. Would it ever be admissible? Well, I go to the beginning of this thing. First of all, I, I think what she says is, well, what I heard was is she she rattles off what the daughter says, blah, 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 blah. And then as an aside, she says, I didn't say that. That's that's to me. It's pretty obvious. Uh, mm -hmm. The audio is quite good. And uh, we used to do this all the time. We would have audios cleaned up quite a bit, and you could even hear it more clear. But uh, I, I don't think she says, yeah, you, yeah, I said you did. I think she's pretty clear to me. She says, I, I didn't say that. I didn't say she was. I have something worse to that effect. Yeah. Oh. And, and Ms. Paradise here says, I think she says, we didn't say that, meaning Donna was defending. And she says, because she says again, I didn't say that. Uh, she said, yeah, I didn't say that. She's she's saying what the daughter said, and then she's telling the person who she's reading this to, I didn't say that. So um, from that aspect, I don't think there's anything particularly revealing here. Uh, in terms of can it be used, um, I, I I don't think, I mean, I just, I guess I'm respectfully disagreeing a little bit here with Scott. I don't think this enters in near, it enters into the realm of a wiretap at all. I mean, this is a, a, a uh, recorded call. Everybody knows that it's recorded. I'm to Scott's question about how, how do we even get to this recording? Which, which means what? That she, on her side of it, did not disconnect the call. So I don't know if the way those systems are set up, that they are purposeful in the fact that if the party from the outside it does not terminate the call, it continues to record because it's continued to be connected. And they glean whatever can be said after that. So 
So I guess my question here is, is how long does this go on with this recording? At what point in time does it end? Why does it end? I don't think there's any expectation of privacy here on what she knew was a recorded line in the first place. And I think just because uh, it doesn't disconnect for whatever reason, it immediately turns it into a wiretap. I, I just don't, I don't think there becomes an expectation of privacy. So, and that, that's just my opinion. Now, I, I, I don't know what the, because there are, there are different laws in different states regarding the recording of people in a conversation, either on phone or with a body mic and so forth and so on. In Texas, uh, only one party needs to know that there is a recording being made. And of course, in Texas, it's always the police that mm -hmm. are, are, are aware of that. There are other states, I think California may be one, where both parties have to be have to know that they're being recorded unless you go the route of uh, getting some sort of a court order to uh, override that and make these surreptitious phone calls and recordings or get into the wiretap aspect, which is a completely different aspect, which is where, and Scott's talked about this, which is uh, uh, where you are actually sitting in a room and you are listening to live conversations as they take place, thus the wire. So um, I think this is pretty simple in terms of that. Um, but unless there's something much more revealing throughout this conversation, I, I don't see that it's really, uh, I guess if we were in Vegas, to me, it'd be a push. Mm. Uh, yeah, there's something like uh, there's over five hours worth of these jailhouse calls. Just so you guys know, between Charlie's conviction and the week before Donna was put into custody, they spoke for over 35 hours uh, on the phone, more than uh, five hours a day. They were talking on the phone, which is kind of crazy. Shelly Klein here says, doesn't the again, I didn't say that, refer back to Donna saying I didn't say she was. This is an interesting comment from uh, my new friend, Philly shoulder surgeon, um, Scott Duffy. I hope you never need her, but if you do, your shoulders look strong, Scott. But if you do, she's in Philly. Uh, she says here, Scott, I think it's really interesting. Wendy says, this is Wendy. I know you are upset about the verdict, not we're all upset or this is terrible for our family or whatever. She's saying y'all are on your own. You see it the same way, Scott? Yeah, I, I, I would pretty much agree with that statement. She, uh, she's the lawyer in the family. So she's, she's dotting her eyes, crossing her T's, making it very clear. Um, you know, I don't want any part of what, what is happening. Um, and so, uh, good luck to all of you. And, yeah. <laughs> well, look, that just to that, um, the daughter, Wendy mm -hmm. was a witness for the prosecution, correct? Yes. And it's her ex-husband that ends up being murdered. Correct. Correct. At the behest of this idiot that just got convicted. Charlie Adelson, correct. Uh, they horse, think that the, they think so. And his horse-faced mother, right? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what the COE would say. This this show is off the rails. We're getting into... Uh, <laughs> but this, So this is Charlie. He's the one who uh, apparently put things into motion, but... Phil Donna, the matriarch, is uh, they say the mastermind. Now, I, I believe that but Wendy. What I, ha I think Wendy was pushing some buttons at the very least. But go ahead, Phil. I'm trying to get the characters here in order. Yes. So Donna's now been arrested, right? Correct. And she was arrested after one week after her son's conviction. One week after. So. The, as far as we know, the only people that law enforcement has brought 
that, that's going to hold responsible. Yeah, John Hamm is innocent, by the way. He's completely innocent. I just want to say that on the record. John Hamm is innocent. He's kind of handsome. Go ahead, Phil. So the only the only people thus far that have been held responsible or are going to be held responsible, presumably, with a successful prosecution, is the mother and the son. Is that right? Mm, yes. Is that right? In, in addition to the shooter. Yeah, well, yeah, the, the, obviously the guy that actually did it. So uh, my, my point here is the, the ex-wife, the daughter, Wendy, when she says, I know you're upset about this conviction or words to that effect, what that tells me is she's not upset about it. And whether it is sincere or whether it is posturing, she is certainly making it clear that she seems to be very happy about the conviction. She didn't have anything to do with this. She may have had a problem with her ex-husband, <clears throat> but she certainly was not involved in his murder. And so she, I'm just reading between the lines here, my opinion, she, when she says that to mom, I know you're upset about the conviction. She's sending a message there that I'm not upset about it. In fact, I'm ecstatic about it. So uh, I think they're going to be, <clears throat> at this point, hard pressed to get, I mean, unless something really, and this exchange between between mother and daughter, between Wendy and Donna, um, it's interesting to me because the mom seems to be pissed. And the daughter is saying, quit freaking talking to me about it. I'm not talking about this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I had nothing to do with it. And I know you're upset. And I'm assuming also, excuse me, that this conversation took place before donna gets arrested obviously right yes yes by the way let me read my favorite comment of the day so far there's a lot of validity to this uh from april loves golf she looks like a wonderful woman this guy who cuts off his mother carm all the time has marble mouth aphasia he mistranscribes more blatant facts loses his place and tries to be relevant content is great but the host is cringy. Thank you very much. I appreciate that very much. Um, at least the content is great. Um, but I appreciate you speaking truthfully, uh, truth to power. And I would admit, I have a bit of a uh, marble mouth today and uh, a little lost on the transcription. So uh, April loves golf. Um, I don't wish that anyone hits you with a club by accident. I would never say that. But um I think you bring up some salient points and I'm not a hundred percent sure that cringy is without a knee, but I'll have to look that one up. Phil, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, Phil. Oh, no, I, I, I think I, I think I'm <laughs> I Scott, anything to add on that call? There's a couple other calls I would like to play. I think Phil, Phil brought it home. That's like, that's a, that's a great context to it. Let's move on to the next one here. Here we go. Uh, for whatever her name was, Golf Lady, I have no idea what this is. It's a Friday. Here we go. Well, I, I thought it was going to be more fast-paced than, than, like, show -making. Yeah. Only one side had facts. The other side was just blatant, blatant nonsense and lies. Scott Duffy, um, look. They are uh, declarative, saying the state basically made up stuff. Only the defense had facts. Uh, what do you make of that? Are they in a bit of denial? Are they finger pointing? Well, the jury surely didn't see it that way. So, um, you know, it, and and it's you know, of course, she is uh, innocent until proven guilty, right? Or not? Not well. Yes, innocent until proven guilty. So, what exactly if if, if you no. What exactly is she charged with? Is she charged with the same charges as a co-conspirator or something 
in the planning or post. Donna, evidence. you're talking? Donna and Charlie yeah, Donna, are Donna, 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 murder, Donna. conspiracy, and solicitation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, in that context, a co-conspirator talking to another co-conspirator, of course, they're all wrong. We're all right. That I've heard that played many, many times from uh, the defense side. Yeah, uh, Jay Adams coming in uh, to the last bit of sound from marbled mouth aphasia, yours truly. Donna is clearly saying I didn't say she was to her friend in the room. This soundbite issue seems to be a red herring. It might be, and the media likes to hop on those sorts of things. Uh, Ned Smith, one of my best friends in life for a reason. It is cringy with an EY. So golf lady, why don't you learn to spell before you criticize? Adam Lamparello is an attorney, super sticker. There is no evidence whatsoever showing that Donna knew of the plan before it happened. Adam almost sounds like Donna's attorney. He's coming in quite a bit into the chat, but I respect it. It only shows that she became aware of it and covered it up. That's not enough for conspiracy. Uh, Phil Waters, you want to take a stab at that? Do you agree with Adam Lamparello? I know you're not an attorney, Phil, but you might as well be one. And, and what, what is his basic statement? Uh, he is saying that maybe Donna knew about it after the fact, and that is not, a, and then covered it up. But it's not enough for conspiracy. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the, the what the law is there, and in terms of that kind of a thing. And we were using these terms like co-conspirator and and uh, you know, uh, and understand. I'm at least for myself, all of this at this point, we're commenting about the scope of these phone calls and what they may imply or indicate. Uh, we're not delving off into this whole total investigation thing. You've been doing this for, for months now. And uh, so all the folks that are running around, she's a co-conspirator, she's this and that. Well, all I know is, is what I know. And that is she's not in jail, Wendy. Hmm. Donna is. And, you know, in a lot of cases, the cover up is worse than the actual event. Now, in this particular case, it's a murder, so it's not going to get much worse. But it regard, it's kind of the, it's the old story, right? When did she know? When did she know? What did she know? And when did she know it? Yeah. And so if she's involved in. Just to say for the sake of our discussion, and I wish people would listen when we talk about this as our opinion or for the sake of this discussion at this particular time, let's just say that she is involved in the cover-up. Well, that makes her a co-conspirator and a party to the offense in the sense that she is now participating in obstruction of justice. So, um, we, we've got to look at things in 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 the context in which they are they are occurring. And so for everybody to jump up and go come to these conclusions and, you know, you got Wendy's this and she's that and blah, blah, blah. Look, I'm going to say it again. I let evidence lead me where I need to be as I see more evidence or I hear more about the cases, whatever we're discussing, then I will. Possibly change my view or opinion, depending on where that evidence leads me. And it's always a journey for the truth. It doesn't make any difference what my opinion is about what I think in terms of just an emotional response to this stuff. So again, when, when you ask Scott and I, these questions, we're giving our professional view based on our years of experience and in invo in involving these types of investigations. So um, everybody just needs to kind of, you know, hold their water a little bit. We're discussing a very specific part of this overall picture here. So I, I'm not, I'm not willing to jump up and say, Wendy's, this, Wendy's that, because we're talking about this specific conversation. And it would appear to me that if she's involved in it, she's smart and she's keeping her mouth shut. The mother, not so smart. And even if all she was was involved in a cover-up, she's just as complicit. So therefore, 
she's getting charged. It's like the guy that, that they go and they rob a bank and the guy inside the bank kills the guard on his way out, but the guy driving the car gets charged with the murder. So, uh, you know, capital murder. So I, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, parties to the offense have different degrees of involvement. Mm. Uh, Phil Waters, look at this. Uh, I hope you can understand me through my marbles. Miss Brazy 604 with a super sticker. I'm a huge fan of Phil Waters for so long. I'm a star-crossed fan seeing him here live. So much respect for you, Phil, for all you did during your times as a dedicated law enforcement official and an all-around great man. Well, thank you. That is very kind. I, I I do appreciate those kind words, and I and I want to say now before I forget, I I do appreciate all the the love and support and prayers through this uh, last uh, ten days. So so that's very very uh, very it's very humbling. I do appreciate that. Uh, Phil Waters, I should never ask you this question, but everyone here knows the answer on my end. Uh, but how? God forbid this ever happens, but how do you think you would fare in prison, Phil Waters? Uh, you seem to adapt well to a knee replacement surgery. Uh, if you ever found yourself in prison, would you just man up? How do you think you'd do in there? Well, uh, I would approach it. I've approached most things that are challenges is, uh, you know, full speed ahead. Um, I'm certainly not going to let anybody take advantage. Um, and I would have to take quite a beat down or death for them to, to, uh, take advantage of me. So, uh, you know, I'm going to, they, could, they couldn't, they could not stare down the barrel of your 45 in, in prison, but they could stare down the barrel of your big bare fists. Um, and I mean, bear like not bear naked, uh, Scott Duffy, same question to you. How do you think you would do in how do you think you would do in prison, Scott Tuffy? It's, it's, next question. <laughs> okay. Scott, um, Scott, Scott would lull <laughs> into a uh, uh, a feeling of uh, security counts, I think. Scott would just uh, with his mellifluous voice, he would soothe everyone. Uh, so there you go. So this I've been I'll, stalling. I'll say this. It, yeah, go it, ahead. It's intimidating to walk through there, you know, without your gun. It's it's intimidating. And you know you're on the right side of it walking in to do an interview, whatever it is. It, it is intimidating. And do you get heckled, Scott, when you go in there as an FBI agent? Oh, sure. they you? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I any yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and what because they don't they don't like the uh the police, as Phil calls them. When you walk in there, um they are not, um, they're not your biggest fans, correct? No, not your biggest fans. Nope. Not at all. <laughs> it's well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. Uh, when I worked undercover, I have been put in jail. Uh, and I knew I was getting out. <laughs> Wait, this, this is wild. You got put in jail as part of your job. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I was put in a, an isolated cell, of course, but I was arrested. I just bought, you know, whatever, a couple of kilos of cocaine, uh, you know, 10,000 hits of ecstasy, whatever it may have been. And I'm arrested in front of the crooks and I'm transported just like they are. And I'm put in a jail cell, but I'm put in a jail cell by myself. And however, I know I'm getting out, but uh, I'm telling you, that is a that is not a good feeling. And then having walked through prison, I've been up to death row here in Texas and and talked to those guys. And um, uh, let me tell you what, uh, that's that's a. Uh, I, I, I people that get there and continue to go back is kind of amazing to me. I mean, recidivism is very high, but, uh, but I, you know, that goes back to what I've been saying about a lot of things. It's a, that's a problem with the, the heart and the head. So, uh, uh, yeah, that, that, uh, that prison life ain't for me. 
And um, Phil, you can't mention Death Row and just kind of gloss over it. What is Death Row like? What was it like talking to those guys? And uh, I love these Friday tangential conversations. What's it like in there? Well, they're all in their own, at least in Texas, they're all in their own, their own individual cell. They get, I, I think I'm right about this, and they are in that cell for 23 of 24 hours. They get one hour by themselves to a recreational yard, so to speak, where they can go out and. Oh you boy, know, he froze. Do, okay, go so ahead. I'm sorry. Do, and then they're put back in there. Uh, now they can communicate. I mean, they're all right there next to one another and they can all talk to one another and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it's a. Um, it's it's just a place that you you don't want to go to. I mean, it's just I can't think of any. And, and look, I mean, and they're getting three hots and a cot. You know, I mean, they're they're getting fed and so forth and so on. But yeah, I mean, that's uh, you know, here's the one thing that I used to tell when I would teach. There is there is one act that a police officer can commit a law enforcement official can commit that no other, no other person on the face of the planet can. And that is take a person's liberty away from them. As a police officer, Scott is a special agent, a police officer. We have the ability at any point in time during our shift, during our career to do something that 95% of the population cannot do. And that is to take a person's liberty away from them. Mm. So you better make sure that if you're going to make that decision, and it's always going to be as a result of something they did, but it you better be right. Because there's nothing, there's nothing worse. If you want to, if you want to, um, if you want to understand freedom in black and white terms, Take a tour of death row. Take a tour of a prison system, a prison yard somewhere. And understand that those folks are in there. They have lost their liberty. They have lost their freedom. Now, granted, it's because of something they did. They're being held accountable. But, uh, you know, that's a that's a huge, huge uh, responsibility that, that law enforcement has. And um, and uh, so it's 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 very prevalent in a place like death row, when you look around and you see these guys up there and gals that uh, have had their liberty taken from them, convicted because of something that they did beyond a reasonable doubt. And uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a, a heavy burden. Scott Duffy, could you handle 23 hours a day in a small confined space, Scott Duffy? <laughs> no. Well, yeah. yeah, you know, we'll go back to my my early early days. Um, I would lose my I would lose my mind. I'd have to be put put in a straight jacket, and I would. Could I bang my head hard enough that I mean? Could you take your? Could you unalive yourself by banging your head against the uh, the bars hard enough? I would have to. I, I wouldn't be able to handle it. I would literally lose my mind. Um, Sassy Cat reminds us Wendy is an unindicted. This is true. She's been called an unindicted co-conspirator by the state. Uh, mm -hmm. Meredith here with a super sticker. Donna laughed in court when extradition um, or uh, self-harm was brought up. She had no idea the call didn't drop. My dad would do that as well. And then she looked incredulous when it was brought up. Uh, of course, this is true. Best guess. So I've been stalling this whole time because the title on this next one uh, if there are any children in here, you need to leave immediately. This is titled Sex Toys, and this has to do with Charlie uh, speaking to his um, baseball fan. Yeah. Uh, sex toys that I had at the house. Yeah. You get thrown away and my parents can throw myself. They don't find them. <laughs> yeah. So, what do you? 
Oh my God, I think honey. There stuff in the, I think there was stuff in the end table also that we respect the list. Throw all that shit out. I will. Like, put I will. Put it in and throw it out. You I can put it real up for yourself and then throw all that shit out. All right, so wait, 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 wait. Why are we throwing all your shit out? Like, no, 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 no. It's the sex toys. Like, okay, okay. But I just thought uh, hopefully one day, like, my parents are going to say, like, my dad's almost 80 years old. This is not going to kill him. Babe, wait, wait, wait. I know. Hold, hold on a second. Like this is moving way too fast right now. I'm trying. I'm still in shock. So I will throw all that away. But then now what? what? Do you want me to leave? Like, are you guys selling no, the house? No, I don't. I, don't, I haven't even discussed the house. I don't even know what the what the plan is. It's not going to be something like we're doing something this week or next week. It's not like. I'm not calling to tell you, like, hey, you got to get out by Thursday. We haven't got so much other shit going on. It's not like that at all. But I was just saying, like, I'm letting you know I'm not ever coming home. So... First of all, it says here talking to Janice as housekeeper. She's not his housekeeper. She's his girlfriend. And um, she's also a psychologist in uh, Broward County. She works as a professional psychologist. And uh, I just said that, COE. And she's leaving. She's leaving the house. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, my wife is leaving me. Unbelievable. Right on, during this call. It's hard to believe. Um. Scott Duffy, I hate to come to you on the sex toys call, but what fascinates me about this, <laughs> what what fascinates me about this is this is what he's worried about um, in prison. Uh, obviously, there's nothing incriminating here, but would this be the first thing on your mind? It would certainly not be the first thing on my mind at this point. Scott, would no, you like it, to just forget this entire show today? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was I was looking for the lead up as I saw that earlier with the sex toys streaming on them. And what are we confused? What show this is? Yes, that's why I was, I was trying to avoid it for and uh, you know, I was trying mm. to and people not everyone knows that Scott Duffy started in the seminary that you're uh, a holy man. So wow, um, we're bringing all kinds of good stuff. Up. Yeah, yeah. So what do this? Was to you, this? But I have to. <laughs> <laughs> was this call to his girlfriend? I'm glad you clarified girlfriend because if he's calling his housekeeper, babe, then I'm thinking, okay, then you <laughs> take a look at that. But the, um, this call is if correct me if I'm wrong, th this is, um, post, is this post conviction pre sentencing, right? Uh, this is, this is, Post-conviction, pre-sentencing. Correct. Okay. And he says, yeah. not ever coming home. This is the day after yeah. he's convicted. November. Yeah, he's, One he's, day after he's, he's accepted convicted. that. He's accepted it, and so he's clearing house. It's, you know, it's, um, yeah. It, I, I, I like this, like the whole context. It, is there a lead up? Hey, I miss you, love you, this and that. And and then, oh, by the way, there are some things. Get rid of. It's, it's interesting um, I guess that's a, a living girlfriend. Not that yeah. it matters, but that, that, but I'm thinking, okay, so she's cohabitating with him. Obviously these toys are theirs. It's not like he's asking a housekeeper, Hey, you don't know anything about my private life, but go and remove these. So my beloved parents don't see it. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, he's, um, it's it's been quite a uh, journey from from what he has lived prior to him initiating this plan and executing it to to what it is now. So have go and remove anything slightly embarrassing or whatever he thinks may be that his parents don't, probably don't already know about. It. Yeah, it's 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 a call that needed to be made, so he made it. Mm. He was, he was tying up loose ends there. Uh, this is, Phil, this is articulated much better than Marble Mouth could ever articulate it. And I'm glad that GWTA GEO here wrote this. So what is the only possible way an Adelson can insert a believable narrative? Maybe an accidental hot mic recording, quoting Wendy verbatim. It can now be played in court for reasonable doubt. This is kind of what I was asking you at the beginning. You think Wendy is 
tech. I mean, she never knew that this text was going to be read on a quote unquote hot mic or a hot phone call. But is she savvy enough? And I, I know you don't know her. What I was getting at is that maybe certain things are being said because they know these calls are being recorded and because they would be used in court and because maybe they think they're outsmarting everyone by saying certain things that could ultimately acquit them if they were to be, uh, if they were to face trial. And what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> you think there's, um, there's, you, there's, think, there's, you think that they're conniving enough, the Adelsons, that they're I, saying I, certain things on these calls. I don't, I don't, you, you talk, now we're going back to that first phone call about, you know, don't call me. Yeah, or, or any, yeah, that's the first phone call. That That's the one here that people are talking about. But there's yeah. other things that have been said. Uh, I, I would say this. It sounds to me like Wendy, of, of all these knuckleheads, is is the sharpest one of the bunch. Uh, and there are many times when, to use the term that we've been using here, unindicted co-conspirators, because you... And I've, I've asked this question of people that I've talked to, and it is, what do you want to be? Do you want to be a suspect or do you want to be a witness? Nine times out of ten, they're going to give you an answer, and it's going to be, I want to be a witness. They may be ambivalent. That tenth one may be ambivalent, and they just don't want to say either way. But the point being is that Sometimes in the course of an investigation, you have a person who's involved in some way and you're asking the same question in terms of the investigation. Is this person a better suspect or a better witness? And then you have to make a decision in discussion with other detectives the DA's office about that particular person. They're in this, this middle ground area, this uh, kind of investigative purgatory where they could be either or. And so because she's being shown as an unindicted co-conspirator, I have to believe that she was a better witness than she was a suspect. So um, I think, and, and she's an attorney, she is smart enough that when she engages in these conversations, like we saw, heard with the mother, she's making it very clear. I had nothing to do with this. That's my story. I'm sticking to it and quit asking me questions and trying to get me to talk about it. We're not. We're done. So uh, you use the word connive. I, I don't think it's conniving. I think it's just smart on their mm. part. Uh, mm. uh, all the conniving was done to end this young man's life in the first place. And now we're at the point where everybody's got their little piece of the pie here and they're protecting their little fiefdom. And, uh as long as as long as she continues to maintain, it's kind of like if 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 you, the detectives, law enforcement, if you think I'm involved in this, then prove it. Mm. And uh, apparently they haven't proved it. And so she is shown because she's going to be listed as a possible suspect. The feds use the term unindicted co-conspirator stuff. Um but she's, at least at this point, they've got nothing that they mm. Mm. You. Oh, I think he's getting a call. I think that happens when he gets a call. Did you just get a call, Phil? Yeah, yeah. yeah see, that's what happens. They've got nothing that can be used uh, to make her a defendant. To Put her in jail, get her charged, get her indicted. So uh, look, I keep I keep going back to the Super Bowl. I can't get my mind off it. Imagine again, 
Dallas Cowboy Stadium, 80,000 people. Phil's in the middle of saying something incredibly critical. The crowd's going wild. They can't get enough of uh, Phil Waters. And a call comes in as he's sitting on his recliner on his, you know, on his lazy boy in his house. And the crowd's like, what? What's going What? And now suddenly Phil reappears because like, he has dismissed the call and the crowd goes even crazier. Best well, Super Bowl no, ever. Are you seeing the picture on the screen there? When when you get a call, you disappear for a minute, Phil. Yeah. And it's just it's it's nerve wracking, but I think it would be great dramatic build up during that halftime show. That's um true. Scott, your surgeon is back. She says that Scott Scott Duffy does the main line proud. Um, are you going to do an STS after party at the Grog? Do you know what that means? The Grog. You, well, yeah, I know exactly wh what that is and where it's at. So, are you guys coming? Uh, nice Bill and I Irish will be there. club on on the main line there on um, Lancaster Pike. I I'm going to have to call. I'm going to have to carry mm -hmm. uh, Phil fireman style in there because of his knee um and that will break my back so then we'll have two major injuries it says i think joel is great i also believe donna and i i agree with this i also believe donna and wendy knew what uh the plan was wendy is very good at not self-incriminating however no one is perfect and perhaps she will slip there's another call i'm uh getting tired of this but we're going to play this other call by the way Next week's really the holidays here. Uh, Christmas is rolling around. Uh, Hanukkah already rolled around. And then you've got New Year's. So email us or uh, at survivingthesurvivor at Gmail or tweet us at podcast. <laughs> Give me ideas for next Friday's show with Scott and Phil. Should we even talk true crime or should we just talk about what we're grateful for? Um, it could be anything. We could talk about anything. So shoot me some ideas for a holiday show. Uh, and here we go. That's not Nugget, by the way. That is Poppy. Correct, Phil, right? That is Poppy. And she is standing here looking at me. And uh, I'm not sure what she's, she's not, she's not very happy about me being on this. Because uh, normally I'm upstairs and all that good stuff. So mm. not, uh, she's not terribly happy right now. Let's play this call and see uh, and see what they say, and and then we'll be done with this, and we'll wind up this uh, impressive show. Here we go. I've been looking it up over and over. Because things change if there is extradition from Vietnam, because we we've looked at all the places. I mean, I could go to Korea and China, but there's no extradition. But we're looking for places where there's no extradition. Yeah, Who? Really? Good. Maybe she knows about. Maybe she can look up the extradition issue yeah. before we waste, waste our time. She can tell on you that my parents are thinking of leaving the country. My lawyer told us to do that. Okay, but if you mention it to Wendy, is Wendy going to tell somebody? Well, you, you tell her beforehand. I need to tell you something as as an attorney who doesn't doesn't talk and has nothing to do with the case. Uh, Scott Duffy. So she is openly talking about finding countries that have no extradition, extradition treaties. And by the way, we had Dr. G, J.P. Gar Garrison on, who is an expert in South Korea. And he said, no, there is an extradition uh, treaty between the United States and South Korea. That led him to believe that maybe Donna was thinking of going to North Korea, which is why I am not Chi Pain, our, our uh, mod known as the meme queen, made this. Look at this, Scott Duffy. <laughs> I knew we should have gotten flights to North Korea, courtesy of STS and meme queen, a.k.a. The production value on our show has really gone through the roof. It's amazing the different things that we bring you here. But Scott Duffy, she's talking openly about fleeing the country. The, the family, her and her husband, were trying to get to Vietnam via Dubai, and they bought a one-way ticket. If she ever goes to trial, this woman with the tat sleeved arm, this is consciousness of guilt, isn't it? Is this incriminating for her? Yeah, it, it can be used. And again, jurisdictions may be different. It can be used um, it's when, when somebody flees. And I, I take it this is um, this conversation led authorities to to move rather quickly. Um. And then, of course, I think she was arrested at the airport, correct? 
or near the airport or in she, was, to the she airport. was she was arrested on the jetway she oh, or wow. had already yeah. shown her passport gotten her ticket and was about to get through that plane door but they i think they do that purposely they are waiting for her just to prove that she was trying to flee and that's where they nabbed her scott duck yeah yeah and then so i Yes, yeah, so that's it. It'd be interesting if that phone call didn't play, take place and she had not had any type of plans that could be found out by law enforcement about this type of travel. Um, if they would have still been gathering some some additional evidence, but it seemed like they needed to act and act quickly, and so they did, and they 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 got her. But yeah, they, it can be used. It absolutely can be used. Um, Phil, I know you're dealing with your knee. If you have to leave us, Phil, I will never be upset. Do you have to run? Well, right now, I think my I think Poppy is a couple of things. I think she's hungry, mm. and uh, she wants to go outside. Mm. But can you take her outside in your state? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You can. So, do should we let you go and do your thing, Scott? Uh, Phil, not Scott. Phil. Well, yeah. I mean, that's fine. That's fine. Sure. I mean, you know, I want to keep you, but I don't want your, you know, you're there with a knee replacement and I can tell like, uh, your choice. Uh, the issue now is that my, I think my puppy dog is, uh, is hungry and in need of, uh, a walk in the woods. Phil, we love you to death. I'm glad your knee's doing better. Um, Thank save some of the junk food we sent you and uh we'll do some sort of special show next friday how's that ah well you know you don't do anything on my on my account i'm just glad i'm able to be here and uh again uh carry on it's great to be back with you guys and again i appreciate all the uh the uh, thoughts and prayers and um uh, and believe me they are they are felt they are felt hmm. Phil, one last question. It's a bit personal. You do not have to answer. I hope you can understand me with my marble mouth. But um, does your wife does your wife have tat sleeves? Does my wife have what? Tattooed arms, like Donna does in this picture. Oh, oh, tat uh, sleeves. No, no, tat no, sleeves. no, 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 no
I've never and never would ever hear my mother say I'm not that strong. She would fight through anything, tooth or nail, to her death. She would never show this kind of weakness. Uh, but I understand it because I might because uh, their life is absolute hell right now. But uh, this was used in court, apparently, because, again, she's basically implying that she's ready to unalive herself, as Phil Water says. And that's why she was put under direct observation. So this was apparently used in a court of law already. Uh, what do you read into this? Well, I don't, I don't think you even have to read into it, Joe. She's, she's, um, yeah, that, I mean, it, it's, uh, first of all, the comment about how sad it is for, you know, if only you can reverse the clock and, and then people, it goes to show you regardless of, your place in life, wealth, no wealth, no money. Um, that uh, when you start to ponder a crime, there there isn't a whole lot. And I've seen this time and time again, where there isn't a whole lot of forethought into the consequences and everybody affected. Um, so here, you know, the obvious horrible... Um, victim himself and everybody surrounding him and then of course all the doers that uh the, and and everybody around them so it's just a domino effect of and and it is tragic if if you didn't feel for them then i don't think you're you know you're you're human but a terrible thing was done and so thereby now the law has to has to exact uh justice and and so you know, she's um, she's just stating the obvious of just how difficult it is. And um, and and I don't know, is there regret, remorse? Not sure. But but obviously life as they knew it is is uh, has changed. And just she just um, but 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 good for that to be a call because law enforcement has to, you know, present facts in court. And and so when you are at some sort of detention hearing. Hey, I, I'm not going to flee. I'm not going to, I'm not going to leave my house, put me on house arrest. Everything's good. But then you, you, um, you have to counter that argument and, and what better than with someone's own words, you know? So, um, you know, that's, it's, it's tough to do, but you know, that's to the very end and who knows where, where it's, where it's going to stop. Polka dots, Scott Duffy, uh, anyone contemplating murder needs to ask themselves, am I willing to destroy my own life also? A uh, very right. um, yeah. prescient comment here, yes. And then Ned Smith, uh, very observant. Nobody ever says, I didn't do it on any of these recordings. Uh, that is true. Uh, it's mm -hmm. interesting. If I was innocent, I'd be crying to my mother. I would say, Carm, I didn't do it. Carm, I swear I didn't do it. Tears would be trickling down my face and I'd be saying I didn't do it. But we don't hear that here. We hear the uh, or see or feel or metaphorically the uh, finger, the uh, finger of blame is being pointed everywhere. Uh, but upon themselves, as Steve Cohen says, they should be pointing the thumb, not the finger. That's what Steve Cohen says. The great Steve Cohen point the thumb, not the finger. Hmm. Anyway, uh, Raul Thomas, look at this, giving me credit for the, the, the way Joel paints. The, I really can't talk today. Golf lady was right. <laughs> the way Joel paints the canvas, driving around in the pouring rain, listening to Don. I was yesterday. I was attending to some uh, Markel related business. And um, I'm amazed that we're still on the YouTube here because we are getting the equivalent of not a hurricane, but horrific weather the next there's some kind of crazy storm engulfing all of florida with potential tornadoes all sorts of things and uh, it is starting to get dark and eerie mm -hmm. but um scott duffy let me ask you this if we could do anything next friday and we can because we run this show what would you want to do for our holiday special maybe we don't talk uh true crime at all but what would we what would we talk about if we didn't do that? Well, we can. Um, I, I think we have to have a little bit of true crime, maybe something with um, 
with a Christmas, New Year's, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, mm -hmm. and every other great combination of celebration with with the with the crime element. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they <laughs> they exist out there, and then bring our animals. I'll try to um hoard my my um. Which, by the way, reminded me because last week someone asked you to bring Chi Chi the Chinchilla. Yeah, but next yeah I week thought about that. So, so I'll I think bring it. Next yeah. Friday would be a, a good time because it, it I may have to step out and come back in with him, yeah. and so be it. And I'll, I'll try to bring Ethel, who will uh, stay in frame for one tenth of one second. Uh, Nicole Gross with a super sticker. Uh, Donna's about to have a rude awakening when she finds out she isn't smarter than the court witnesses and every attorney involved that uh very well could be true scott duffy i'm going to leave it up to you uh final inspirational words uh you were in the seminary at one point not to be confused with the cemetery um your final chris someone said christmas true crime uh i yeah. don't know exactly what that means but uh we will try to figure it out people want us look they're they're clamoring they want to see chi chi and ethel be amazing yep. if I Let's could get Chi Chi to go on Ethel's shoulder. That yeah, that 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 can happen. Do your does Chi Chi ever go on your dog's backs yeah, or do we'll, they go crazy? We'll, we'll put them on their backs. And what happens? Oh, we won't let him because he'll 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 leave. But um, no, he's he's he, he just he's a, a back scratcher. He just just wait wait wait. What, what do you mean he'll leave? Like if you like, he'll jump does off. he he'll, run away? Yeah. Well, between yeah, and between Pearl running and Chi Chi, you know, running one way, they then I'll have to uh, try to. Um, but but if Chi Chi gets and... if Chi Chi gets to the floor, is he gone? Are, are you like? Is oh he yeah, out of yeah, there? he's gone. I I think I have a. It all depends what room he's in, but I don't want him to get in between the walls where I can't get him. So mm. we'll mm. we'll take him into a room. Where he can just go around and he jumps very high. How high does he jump? He's like a little fat ball of. Yeah, of, he could probably um, he can jump using a wall as his catapult for easily four or five feet. Wow! Let me tell you an interesting yeah. story this week, Scott, because we haven't talked about enough nonsense, and I promise I'll let you go. Um, I want to say it was Tuesday. I was at home working on this show. And I hear a noise and I hear Ethel going crazy. And I go to my front door and lo and behold, there's a white French bulldog just at my front door, just standing there, happy as could be, wagging her, his, his little stump of a tail. And um, didn't know what to do. No collar, no name, no no nothing, nothing, zero. So what did I do? I called the police department. And the first thing I said, I said, this is a non-emergency call. And I said, a white bulldog has showed up at my door. And um, I'm in a small town. Took a little while. I don't want to throw him under the bus. But 25 minutes later, um, the officer shows up. And since it's Florida, we are conducting. I had now put the white bulldog, French bulldog, and ethel in the backyard together and i had just been bemoaning to my wife there's a, i don't know if you're aware of this there's a national respiratory virus going around for dogs are you aware of this mm. yes i am yeah yep. and so so i haven't been taking her here we can go to a dog park still nothing and she's losing her mind and now it's raining and i was just saying to the coe i was saying this is great i like this golf lady needs to chip right off yes she does <laughs> i wish i thought of that but good job rose um, so this French bulldog and Ethel, right. As I was saying, Ethel needed a friend. He, he shows up and they're having the time of their life. Well, 20 minutes later, the police officer shows up. He has a machine that reads chips on dogs, reads this dog has a chip, but the chip has no information associated with it. Mm. All they know is that the dog is chipped. Turns out the police officer's wife works in animal rescue, he contacts Miami-Dade Animal Rescue. They say there's not much they can do. Eventually, you'd have to bring the dog there. I say there's no way. I am letting this dog go to Miami-Dade Animal Rescue. It will sit in a kennel like a dog, and you don't know what's going to happen. I insist. I tell the officer, 
this dog will stay with me. Uh, my kids were at school, thank God. And uh, look at this, Miami. It's a small section of Miami. that I'm, There are little towns around Miami, but I get it, Armand. Uh, pl please hit the like button. Luckily, there's no dislike button that I'm aware of. Um, and lo and behold, Scott Duffy, I volunteer now to watch this dog. The two dogs, Ethel and this unnamed, unidentified. I could not swab it for DNA. I didn't have the, you know, the materials. This dog is just at my house now, and there's no identification. The police officer says goodbye, good luck. He says, let me know what happens. Two, three hours later, we have brand new next, literally brand new next door neighbors and they're renting. So we don't really, they just got in. We don't know them. And uh, it's their dog, our, our wow. very next door neighbors. So I said to them, it might be a good idea every once in a while if Ethel and uh, look at this, Ned Smith. I was going to take, I was going to take him. Never <laughs> even got the name, I don't think, but uh I did recommend that they have some play dates and I hope this dog doesn't have the respiratory virus, but I thought I would share that very pointless, long, um, <laughs> anticlimactic story with you, uh, before we head out. I hope I think it's it. great. I, I, uh, I had a similar incident, but it, it wasn't just a day for me. 15 years ago, we, hmm. um, we took a cat, what I thought would be temporary, but 15 years later, Mm. He's still here. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you. You seem like the kind of guy that's going to take the dog. So the cat is 15 or older. We don't know. Yeah, but I'm, uh, closing it on 15. She's been maybe 14, maybe. But she's uh, she's she's doing very well. She's she's ours mm. for sure now. But yeah, it's been a while. I think you've uh, passed the statute of limitations. Ned Smith, dogs are an excellent judge of character. Uh, this dog couldn't care less about me, but. But he liked Ethel, so I guess he likes Ethel's character. Nice. Uh, Joel is now fostering strays. I am. Um, Scott Duffy, I say this every week, it seems like, but this was definitely one of the weirdest shows uh, imaginable. We went from John Hamm to the seminary to um, certain <laughs> private parts of the body to uh, toys that grown adults use. Let me tell you a very funny quick story about um, – <laughs> This is actually a very funny story. You guys are going to, it's anticlimactic once again. We, I got this job at Fox News Channel. I'm in New York City. They move us from New York City to DC. We hired this crew uh, of movers. And my wife had people help us when we moved from New York to DC. Okay, so we moved from New York to DC many big boxes. And I was traveling all the time because I was a news guy. I was always away. I, I didn't see any of the packaging, any of that. We get to Washington DC where the crew is now there unloading, but it's a slightly different crew. And, um, these guys were hilarious. They were fun and, um, they're enjoying themselves. And then all of a sudden I hear them die laughing. It was an explosion of laughter. And I said, what is going on here? Wow, our numbers are plummeting right now in this live chat, but it's okay. It's, I can handle it. We're already an hour and 53 minutes in. So um, I hear this explosion of laughter and I walk into the kind of the living room area where there's just box upon box. Of, you know how it is when you move, Scott, which you probably haven't done in many years because you're disciplined. You've got a steady career. I had a very unsteady career. I'm <laughs> undisciplined. So anyway, there's a million boxes. It looks like a nuclear bomb went off. And these guys are doubled over. It was almost like a half a refrigerator sized box. And whoever didn't speak English very well in New York wrote in perfect English, adult toys in giant letters, adult toys. So now these guys are all high-fiving me because this is a half of a refrigerator sized box. And they think that I am a man let's put it that way because it says adult toys what they didn't know is i'm a diehard mma fan and i'm sort of a collectibles guy and so i have figurines of ufc fighters and other memorabilia like bruce lee in their original boxes which were in this box filling the box and they thought it was something else scott duffy because it said adult toys so so 
the question I would have, who wrote adult toys? Um, so we As opposed had, to fragile or something else. Yes. So we <laughs> had, um, I'm glad you asked that. That's a great question, an investigative type question. And I'm glad you asked it. Um, they actually were adult toys. Uh, they were, they're my toys. Um, so people are asking who labeled that. And I'm glad you asked. So we had very small children and we had a nanny and she could write English, but the comprehension didn't necessarily translate okay. from English yep. mm -hmm. Spanish. And so that instead of sense. writing, like I would have written like action figures or I would have written whoever these are is a complete loser uh, on the box or what kind of grown man would have this. I would write that. Joel's one. dolls. Joel's Something. dolls. Right. But yeah. I would never write adult toys because then you're thinking like. Times There's Square only in the 1970s. Um, look at this. Side Barbie says, sure, Joel, what was really in the box? One day, maybe for the holiday, and um, look at look at yeah, your, yeah. Your, your shoulder friend is back. I love the detail and the analysis. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, thank you, Philly. I'm just going to call you Phil, PSS or Philly from now on. Um, final thing, Scott Duffy, uh, are, you, are you still under the belief or in the belief or believe that the Philadelphia Eagles are going to the Super Bowl this year. Hmm. Have you yes. wavered? You you are yeah, no no waiver. I oh yeah. Do I bet? Did I bet on it? No. But no, it's they. Uh, it's an uphill battle as opposed to a couple of weeks ago where it was theirs. They'll fight. They'll get it. Hmm. Yeah, no, no inflatable dolls, all UFC stuff. I'll have to send, I'll put some pictures up on Instagram of my, what's happened since then is I had a boy, Scott Duffy, uh, by the way, Space Coast, uh, shout out to Space Coast, shout out to the mods, shout out to the COE, Niners are winning the Super Bowl this year, yeah, whatever. Um, the, the, the Niners are going to be, I think, like, like the... Uh... Baltimore Orioles, you know, great, but then just just going to fizzle out in the playoffs. So nice try. There you go. And look at this. Fly, Eagles, fly. Fly, Eagles, fly. Uh, San Fran is formidable right now. Someone chiming in. Scott Duffy, uh, this is a painfully weird show. We'll come up with something for next Friday. What Any any big weekend plans and your final thoughts, Scott? Uh, no, no big weekend plan so just kind of taking it easy getting ready for the week the uh the college kids are home they're done so mm. the house is full again and what are you doing for uh christmas itself what do you do for uh the holiday i almost fell off my own table just now yeah i i'm i'll uh, be hosting it's just my uh my younger brother his kids so they'll pop on over we'll have uh Oh, I, I kind of change it up every year, but I I try to add things. Nothing. So I I, I think I'm going to do across the board, like turkey, ham, mm. some Italian, and then some fixings. So it's and do you, Scott? Do you cook? I feel like you cook. No, I I I wouldn't say I cook. I will say I think, and I go with the evidence of who's taken, who's eating, and hasn't dropped dead. Um that I can do a turkey pretty good. Hmm. Let me ask you another question, because this came up uh, between the COE and I today. My father was not handy at all. Um, I hate to admit yeah, this, it's a bit embarrassing, but he would hire handymen. Um, if I asked you to drill something into a wall right now, can you do it? Are you handy with a drill? I can, I can, I can drill a hole. I couldn't figure a wire out. I, I would be very much the same way. I, I have, uh, I've learned to befriend the right people who mm. are electricians or can put things together or fix things that I screw up. Cause I'm, I'm reworking our studio. I have um, like a schizophrenic mindset with that. And so I want to change a few things and some of the things I ordered came in and I had some time and I'm like, I want to put this up. And then I said to myself, I don't know how to drill and I need to drill. And then I started to just, ponder my entire life um the way my father raised me may he rest in peace um he was not handy um and i am not handy and um i will try to teach and do better with my child i'll at least i don't know show him how to change a light bulb 
uh, something of that nature before it's all said and done. That's a good, that's a good start. That's about my, I, I can, I can duplicate something so I can take, I can take a wall sconce off. I can replace it wire to wire. I'll take pictures of it. I'll stare at it for a while. And then I'll, when I flip the switch on, I'll, I'll cringe expecting explosion. But that's, I can do that. That's about it. Look at this. Wildfire says that is a lofty goal, Joel. I'm going to try to yeah. teach my child to change a light bulb. Um, what amazes me, Scott Duffy, and I'll end with this. We're still at 3,500 people in the chat, and I have no idea why. Why anyone would listen to this, while well, anyone would watch this. Um, why? I have no idea, but um, look at this. Mary Griffin says, I absolutely love this show. Uh, why? I don't know. Another super show by Joel and STS. Don't know why anyone would love it, but here we go. Um, love the Eagles. That's what we'll end on. The rain is starting to come down. I'm going to just do Netflix and chill the next 72 hours. No one's going to see or hear from me, but I might um, Instagram out my adult toys uh, for the world to see my UFC action figures until next time. Love you, America. Love you, Tallahassee. Love you, Philadelphia. Love you, Houston. Love you, the big island of Hawaii, everywhere in Europe, all seven continents. And uh, of course, Gambia. Gambia was in our chat this week. Special shout out to Gambia. See you Monday. Dennis Murphy. Dennis Murphy from Dateline NBC will be here. Till then.